DNP3 Secure Authentication is an enhancement through the DNP3 protocol. It's a set of additional function codes, objects, rules, and definitions to be added to the standard protocol. It's contained within a supplement to Volume 2 of the specification. It's designed to ensure the receiver of a message can verify that the message was sent by an authorized user and verify that it was not modified in transit. Security experts would say this means it addresses the threats of spoofing, an attacker pretending to be an authorized user, and modification, an attacker changing the message in transit. In addition, DNP3 Secure Authentication Mechanism includes features that protect against replay. Replay occurs when an attacker captures messages being transmitted on an open link, for instance a radio system, and plays them back at another time, attempting to cause havoc by making the system do something it wasn't supposed to. To protect against such an attack, DNP3 Secure Authentication includes information in each message that changes each time a message is sent. DNP3 Secure Authentication can also help to protect against the threat of repudiation, that is, a valid user claiming not to have performed an incorrect or illegal operation. Although logging is not part of the specification, the authentication mechanism gives the remote device the necessary information to store a permanent log of who performed what operations, providing some degree of repudiation. However, non-repudiation usually requires a digital signature and sometimes a third party. Secure authentication uses a MAC, not a digital signature. A signature requires PKI so that only one user knows the key and could have a signed message. For these reasons, PSK systems cannot claim non-repudiation because two instances know the key at the same time. It's also important to understand what DNP3 secure authentication does not attempt to do. The mechanism does not encrypt the message. This may surprise some people who assume that all electronic security involves scrambling the message. It was decided by the DNP3 Technical Committee, on the advice of utilities, that it was not necessary to protect the message against eavesdropping, an attacker reading what data was in the message. Encryption requires significant processing power on the part of the transmitting and receiving devices, and this cost was not considered worth the benefit, except for encrypting the keys that are downloaded to the outstation. However, DNP3 Secure Authentication does play well with encryption methods, such as TLS, on IP networks. DNP3 Secure Authentication also does not protect against traffic analysis, the ability of an attacker to determine what a utility is doing with a remote device by watching the pattern of message traffic. Lastly, it does not protect against denial of service, that is, an attacker transmitting so many valid or invalid messages at a remote device that it's made unavailable to valid users, or it's brought to its knees. Denial of service attacks can rarely be addressed within the receiving device itself and are best dealt with by an intervening device like a proxy server or firewall that can filter unwanted messages. DNP3 Secure Authentication was designed with the following principles in mind. Authentication only. It addresses authentication only, not encryption or other security measures, as discussed already. It does not rule out the possibility of such measures being added to DNP3 later or through the use of external measures such as a bump in the wire link encryptor or TLS when used over an IP network. Application layer only. DNP3 must be used over a variety of different physical networks and may be bridged from one to the other, as in the case of a TCP IP terminal server or IP radio. Only authentication at the application layer will ensure end-to-end -end security. Application layer authentication also permits the possibility of protection against rogue applications that may be co-resonant with the DNP3 application and attempt to use the DNP3 link without authorization. Based on standards, DNP3 secure authentication follows the IEC 62351-5 specification, which also applies to the IEC 60870-5 family of protocols. IEC 62351-5 makes use of various ISO, IETF, and NIST standards so that the security technology used has been well proven. The only new portion is its application to DNP3. Bidirectional. Either the master or the outstation can authenticate messages. Challenge reply. It is based on the common security concept of challenge and response. The device performing the authentication challenges the sender by providing data that must be included in the authentication calculation. This makes spoofing much more difficult. It also means the receiving device also determines which messages must be authenticated. Pre-shared keys. DNP3 Secure Authentication Version 2 assumed the sender and receiver previously shared a cryptographic key, or string of numbers, through some method other than DNP3. 
BNP3 Secure Authentication version 5 provides a method to permit these pre-shared keys to be changed remotely and securely. Backwards Tolerance The specification attempts to make it possible for a non-secure device to identify that a secure device is using a portion of the protocol it does not recognize without an authentication message causing the non-secure device to fail. This principle is dependent on how well the DNP3 implementation on the non-secure device handles unexpected messages. Upgradable. Security technology is always changing, so the mechanism permits the sender and receiver to identify which algorithms, data, and key sizes that they are using and change these in the future. The specification also requires that any implementation support a mode in which security is turned off on a per-device basis for upgrading purposes. Multiple users. It assumes that there may be multiple users of the system located at the site of the master. It provides a method to authenticate each of the users separately from each other and from the master itself. The intent of this principle is to permit the outstation to conclusively identify the individual user, not just the device, that transmits any protocol message. The DNP3 secure authentication mechanism is based on the concept of a cryptographic hash. A hash is a function like a cyclic redundancy check, or CRC, or a checksum, that when performed on a message produces a much smaller string of numbers. The smaller hash value is very sensitive to changes in the message, but it is virtually impossible to determine the original message or the key if all you have is the hash value. Let's assume Alice is trying to send a message to Bob in a way that Bob can be sure the message is authentic. To make it work, Alice and Bob must have previously shared a key or a string of numbers like a password that only the two of them know. Alice performs the hash function on the message she wants to send concatenated with the key. This produces what is called a message authentication code, or MAC. DNP3, SAV5, and later also support MAC calculation methods that are not technically hashes, but the effect is the same. Alice sends the original message and the MAC value to Bob. She does not send the key because it could be seen by an attacker. However, the message is not encrypted in this case. The attacker can see what the message is doing, but as we shall see, cannot modify it or send a false message of the attacker's own. Bob receives the message. Since he already has a copy of the key, he can now duplicate Alice's calculation. He hashes the message and the key together to produce a MAC. If Bob's MAC value matches the value that Alice transmitted with the message, he knows two things. First, the message has not been tampered with. If an attacker had tampered with the message, Bob's calculation would have been on a different message than Alice used, and therefore the MAC would have been different. The MAC calculation is carefully designed so that without knowing the key, an attacker could not modify the message in such a way that would produce the correct MAC. Secondly, Bob knows that the message came from Alice, or at least someone who knew the pre-shared key. Although the key was not transmitted on the link, it was intrinsic to the calculation, and without it, an attacker could not produce a matching MAC. Because of the way the calculation works, it is nearly impossible to determine the key from the MAC. When a hash is used with a key in this manner, it is known as a message authentication code, or MAC. The mandatory hash function used for DNP3 secure authentication is defined by the National Institute of Science and Technology, or NIST, the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, and the International Standards Organization, or ISO. It is known as the Secure Hash Algorithm, or SHA, or SHA. Two varieties of this algorithm, SHA-1 and SHA-256, may be used in DNP3 secure authentication. This diagram illustrates how IEC 62351 Part 5 provides a common standards basis for SCADA security worldwide. DNP3 secure authentication specification is compliant with IEC 62351-5, and the IEC 6070-5-101 and 104 standards will also be compliant with it. IEC 62351-5 is in turn based on International Standards Organization, Internet Engineering Task Force, and U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology Standards. DNP3 is challenging to secure because it can be used in a variety of networks, including radio systems, serial links, and IP-based wide area networks. Furthermore, it's designed so that from one end of the network to the other, it may travel over more than one of these links. For this reason, DNP3 secure authentication is included in the topmost of the OSI layers, the application layer. There are three types of security that are commonly deployed in communication networks today. Site-to-site -site security includes the use of virtual private network, or VPN, routers and protocols such as IPsec to secure the link between two locations. 
For example, a corporate office and a home office, or a master station and a substation. It does not secure the networks at those two locations, and physical security measures like locks and guards are necessary to protect them. Device-to-device -device security includes the use of protocols such as transport layer security, or TLS, to secure the complete TCP connection between two devices, similar to when you access your bank through the internet. However, TLS only works on IP networks and is therefore lost if DNP3 messages are forwarded over radios or serial links. It also does not address the possibility that rogue software applications may be installed on a device, making use of the fact that the device itself is considered secure. Application-to-application -application security ensures that individual users, not just devices, are authenticated by the remote devices and that the authentication information will be carried wherever the DNP3 message travels. It permits remote outstations to perform rule-based authentication and authorization so that the level of security changes depending on who is attempting to perform an operation. This diagram illustrates how DNP3 secure authentication may be used over a variety of networks. When used over the serial links or radio systems, the authentication function codes and objects are carried like any other DNP3 traffic. When used over IP networks, there are three different options. First, TCP with authentication only, recommended for use over wide area networks and mixed networks. Second, TCP with authentication and encryption, using transport layer security, recommended if messages must travel over a very insecure network, such as the internet. And third, UDP with authentication only, used under specific circumstances when TCP cannot be used and the network is guaranteed to be reliable. Because the DNP3 authentication messages travel at the application layer, they are carried with the rest of the DNP3 message when terminal servers or IP-based radios are used. Some utilities are using these devices to avoid using routable protocols in some portions of their SCADA networks. Using DNP3 secure authentication ensures that there is a security solution even when terminal servers or IP radios are used. One advantage of DNP3 secure authentication is that it allows utilities to deploy DNP3 in a secure fashion over IP networks. Some utilities may be missing the benefits of deploying DNP3 over IP because they are concerned they will be required to deploy very expensive security measures if they do so. DNP3 secure authentication provides security in IP networks and thus provides an evolution path to other IP-based automation solutions such as IEC 61850 in the future. Some vendors may permit such an evolution as a firmware change if the IP networking hardware is already in place. DNP3 secure authentication is suited for the following types of applications. New deployments. Because this is in addition to the DNP3 protocol itself, it will require new software or firmware at both ends of the connection. Therefore, it may be most convenient to deploy DNP3 secure authentication in new networks and investigate other solutions for legacy systems. Unprotected radios. Radio systems with serial link inputs that are not authenticated or encrypted represent one of the most vulnerable types of DNP3 deployments. Deploying DNP3 secure authentication permits these networks to be secured without hardware changes. Multiple users. In networks like the data concentrator system pictured here, DNP3 secure authentication permits a separate identifier to be assigned to each user at the master, for example, Alice or Bob, so that the operations performed by that user are tracked throughout the system. Data concentrators. The specification has rules defined to ensure end-to-end -end security even through a data concentrator such as the configuration pictured here. Varying protocol suites. As discussed previously, DNP3 secure authentication operates at the uppermost protocol layer and is therefore carried across networks that use different lower layer protocols. Mixed IP and serial. As discussed previously, DNP3 secure authentication works well with terminal servers and IP-based radios. This slide shows what's addressed by DNP3 secure authentication. It addresses integrity, spoofing, man in the middle, replay, authentication, authorization, message integrity, and role-based access. Eavesdropping is addressed only to the extent of securing cryptographic keys. A question that many utilities ask is where does DNP3 secure authentication fit with respect to the NERC SIPs? Firstly, as of this writing, July 2014, the mandate of NERC applies only in bulk electrical system, that is transmission, 
So in theory, distribution networks, where many DNP3 deployments are found, are not affected by the SIPs by definition. This may change in the future, however. Secondly, some people make the argument that DNP3 is not a routable protocol and therefore does not need to be secured. That may be true of DNP3 over serial links, but it is certainly not true of DNP3 over IP, because IP, by definition, is a routable protocol. It's not clear how it applies when DNP3 is transferred from an IP network to a serial or radio network. Thirdly, some people make the argument that electronic security controls are not required for SCADA or data traffic, only for remote login to a device. Their argument is that the term external interactive access means remote login. It remains to be seen whether this position is defendable. Lastly, the location that DNP3 secure authentication may be deployed may vary depending on how your organization chooses to define its critical cyber assets and electronic security perimeter. This in turn may depend on how much power may be switched or shed on a given network. Having considered all these items, it may be that your organization chooses to define its electronic security perimeter in such a way that some of its access points carry DNP3 traffic. In these cases, DNP3 secure authentication is intended to provide a technical control to ensure the authenticity of the accessing party. DNP3 authentication version 5 improves on version 2 in several ways. It adds the ability to remotely change keys on all outstations without sending personnel to the site, reducing the cost incurred when an operator leaves the organization or a key is compromised. It adds the ability to control management of keys from a central authority using either pre-shared symmetric keys or security certificates using asymmetric keys, also known as public key encryption, or PKI. The symmetric method is the mandatory default when asymmetric methods are optional. It provides better protection against denial of service attacks by continuing to operate as normally as possible even when suspicious events are encountered. It provides a simple means for detecting some types of attacks by requiring outstations to track and report statistics on the operation of the protocol. It supports cryptographic algorithms that were not available in the earlier version and changes some default algorithms because the older versions are no longer as secure. For instance, AES-256 is now the default for encryption instead of AES-128, and SHA-1 is discouraged, with SHA-256 being the default for hashing. SAV-5 also supports the newer, less processor-intensive GMAC algorithm for calculating MACs.